Hi, good evening. Um, yes, it's now the 8th of May. Um, it's about the 6 o'clock and I thought I'd quickly try and get the poetry um, up for you for week 8 so I can open it up. Um, I want to just go through a few things with you as well. I hope you're all doing well and you're all settling into assignment 2. I think SS2 is due for the SPs tomorrow night and then on Thursday night for the, the FET. So I hope this all going well and you're using the TED Talks and it's been quite a fun exercise for you. So I'm going to share my screen and then we can get to this evening's lecture or learning event as I like to call it. Yes, here's my first slide. It's going to put it on slide share. It's going to be a bit of a problem here. Here we go. Yes, week 8.2, as I said, um, 8.1 was drama and we're looking at poetry now, um, which is also part of SS3 um, for the SPs, whereas drama is for the SS3s for FETs. And he has a lovely verse here from Rita Dove saying, poetry is language at its most distilled and most powerful. How awesome is language, okay, and poetry. Right, I want to quickly go over this again in case you're going onto Canvas and seeing some things have disappeared for those of you that haven't listened to drama yet. Just a reminder that we are going to be doing a few changes because administration has said we can only have five um, online trackers for our participation mark. So I'm going to remove quest, um, online tracker 2 to 4.2 and then we are going to keep online tracker 1 5.1, we all did well. 7.2, which is the cognitive questionings um, with the short story, 8 and 9. Okay. Um, again, just a reminder that SS2 is due this week, um, in case you are not aware of it. So I don't want you all to get a fright and be scared about that. Um, what I'm going to do now, oh yes, and this is what it's going to look like. This is what it looks like on my assignments. I can see that there's week one. I can see there's a 5.1, 5.26, and all the way down. But you can see um, week two to four has disappeared. Um, they've gone to not publish. They haven't disappeared. I've, I can still access them, but they are not published and not, not part of your participation mark. I'm also going to share my screen again. Um, I want to show you what um, week eight looks like. So I'm just going to share my screen again. I'm going to go into Canvas. Uh, let me just find it here. There we go. I think I've got it here for THF. There we go. And so what your Canvas page looks like for me. If I go into week eight, you can see it is still closed. Um, tomorrow is the ninth. I'm going to open it. So if I go into week eight, quick links eight, um, there you can see there's everything. It's the drama. It's the poetry. There's my recording from Sunday. That is the drama recording. I'm going to add the poetry recording here. I will add the poetry PowerPoint as well. I've already uploaded the, the drama PowerPoint. But interestingly, if you go scroll further down into activities, besides the Ferreira reading, you can see there are strategies for teaching poetry um, and 10 poetry teaching tips. So reading a poem is like digging for treasure, what you can find. And this will help the, the SPs for the, the SS3, looking at the elements that they're going to be able to focus on when they're teaching poetry as a genre. And then we've also got the, for the, the drama side, which is for both, but particularly for FET, for SS3, you can look how to teach your first drama class. Um, there's a lot of tips here for teaching drama. If you go into the last section here, oh, and there's your poetry and drama online tracker, but there's also the monkey puzzle, um, survey monkey for me, <laughs> for you to complete on the course and how you're feeling at this point. But if you go into additional resources, um, you can see there's a lovely document on CAPS approaches for teaching literature. So lots of things there, short stories, dramas. Um, I've done the same thing for, for um, first edition language. I've also put two CAPS documents in the additional resources links for you to go and check out as well. It's on poetry. It's on, on teaching other literature forms as well. So go and check that out. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint share. Where we were, there we go. I'm sharing it again. And this is the page we were on. I'm going to continue with this now. Um, let's get it going. That frightened face. So we're in unit three, um, teaching reading in the home language and the digital classroom. And um, we've completed the intensive and the extensive and the speed reading um, from chapter 10. 
we've looked at the novel and short story, we've looked at drama, and tonight we're going to focus on poetry. And that's also in Ferreira chapter 12. Go and check the reading pages on Canvas. So poetry is what we're looking at. From next week, we're going to look at um, visual literacy, all the film studies, the cartoons, adverse pictures, and so on. This will be a separate um, PowerPoint presentation next week. But I think I've also got a Zoom presentation with you next week, which I want to discuss SS3 with you in detail. Okay, so stand by for that. And then finish with best language teaching practices. Okay, just again, a reminder of the due dates. <laughs> I'm a bit fanatical about this now, aren't I? Um, yes, it's the 30th of May for SS3 and the 1st of June for FETs. FETs, you've got the drama and you've got the film. There we are, film still. Whereas SPs have got a poem and they've got an advertisement to get with the same theme. All right, I'm sure you've all got that now. Let's look at what Ferreira says. And there's the page references Ferreira for 187 to 189 for teaching poetry. Um, and the comment from Ferreira is... Um, Students need to get more engagement with the world of the text in poetry, more so than other genres. I'm just going to remove my cat. Yeah, this is punks here. I'm going to take him out. Otherwise, it won't give me peace. Okay. So, all poetry learners need to have more engagement with the world of the text. So remember, this comes straight from Ferreira too. So we've got the world of the text, and there's a lot of figures of speech, rhyme, rhythm, scansion to do with the text that they need to know. They've also got to be aware of the world of the reader. So that what, what is in the world of our students, what do they learn, what are their interests, and so on. So when you choose your poetry for SP, you're going to have to think about what would they really like in poetry. And then there's the world of the writer, and we're going to look at the poem daybreak this evening and we'll show how you can go and have a look at the world of the poet as well so you can see it's quite complex and learners need to know all these things to get into poetry which is sometimes quite difficult for them so what they need to do is be able to identify different poetry types as well so can you see about the world of the text um like odes ballads sonnets haikus also the meta language the the figurative language of poetry um, so this is the traditional approach. Um, the teachers normally tell or teach what the poem is all about and what the poet's intention is, how the poet conveys his or her message. Those are the ways we approach it. And we look at this and looking at the form of the poem, the diction, the rhyme, the rhythm, repetition that happens, figures of speech, onomatopoeia, um, simile, personification, um, rhetorical question, pun, all those things, those wonderful things that happen Similarly, that happen in poetry as well. So students need to know the, those worlds, those that world of the text with that as well. So we can veer away from the traditional approach and look more at a multimodal approach for teaching poetry. And you'll see the reason why we do that, because we're going to look at different styles that students relate to. It's not only the, the, the hearing and the reading, there's the visual, there's the verbal, there's the non-verbal, there's the text, there's the auditory that they can hear, it's music as a means of communication. So this all comes into the multimodal approach because we use differentiation, right? Because we're not all the same, all right? What is differentiation? Some of us are different, or many of us are different. So we need to respond differently to our different students in terms of their interests, what they enjoy doing, their learning profiles, what they what they are strong at, how ready they are to, to appreciate poetry. So these three components represent why we have differentiation in instruction. He has another interesting little cartoon. Um, we've got the teacher at the desk, and he's saying we're going to have a fair selection for this exam. And you've got a monkey, you've got a penguin, an elephant, a goldfish, a seal, a dog. Um, he says, everybody must please climb that tree. Okay, now, is that a very fair assessment? They've all got different abilities. Plus, possibly only the monkey will be able to climb the tree, um, maybe the bird as well, but that's not a very fair assessment. So, yes, we are all different. There's all the pumpkins. Um, even a pumpkin can stand out in a crowded field. What's stopping you from doing the same with your product, with your learners? Let them all stand out as well. 
So let's look at learning is fun as our motto, um, knowing that our students come from different cultures, socioeconomic classes, their languages are different often in the class, their genders are different, their motivations are really different, their abilities and their disabilities are different, plus their personal interests. So you've got this whole kaleidoscope of students in your class you know, which are very different and you need to cope with them and use all their talents as well. So as a teacher, you need to be aware of these differences when you plan your lessons as well. So your teaching materials and your assessments need to be developed so that all students can learn regardless of differences in ability. See how hard it is to be a teacher. And if you have a look at this, this is shows you all the different kind of smarts that we have in our students. Um, if you look there, you've got the students that are word smart, they're linguistically inclined, which I think all of you are. You might have some that are people smart, they're very good interpersonally with each other. Um, and you've also got what you call body smart, which is they very much into um, a kinesiologist and how they can touch and feel things with kinesics. And they're very good at that. But you also have nature smart, music smart, self smart, where you're very much an interpersonal kind of person. You don't like working in groups, but the teacher needs to try and get use all these different talents that we've got in our classroom. So if you think of the poem Daybreak, um, what the lesson pedagogy could you use for this poem as you could with every other poem and there you can see I've got this lovely little video again of the, the, the sun rising daybreak and what it looks like with the colors and so on and this could get your students visually into what we're going to be talking about so we could have visual um, visual is always a very powerful means to provoke prior knowledge and how to get students all on the same page with you um, we've got the text, which we can read, which is the more traditional approach. We've also got the audio text, which they can listen to and they can actually hear as well. We've got the internet for videos, like I've got here. I'll show you a few videos now. And we've got PowerPoints and Prezi with digital and visual representations. You've got group work, which is interpersonal, and you've got individual tasks, which is intrapersonal. And you've also got your students who can do presentations, which is both verbal and nonverbal. So you can cover just about everything if you have this variety when you're teaching a poem. So there we have a nice little image here as well. As you can see, this multiple entry into content. You've got all the different talents around it, the music, the movement, the, the thinking, um, the, the mathematical side, and they all spiral down. They can all give you access to the content if you use all these multiple entries to get the content to the learner. It's not just one single approach. So there's a virtual. You can say to the class as the questions way to start the class, what is your five favorite time of the day? Mine actually wouldn't be sunrise because I'm not really a morning person, so it might be sunset. But um, think about it. What's their favorite time of the day? And then you could show different pictures or they could find different pictures to show favorite pictures of daybreak. This is actually from my house. It's a sea that I'm about 500 meters from the sea and this is walking down from my home. And um, there's a beacon that's along the beachfront, the marine drive there. Um, there's a lovely daybreak. Yes, picture from my house. You can see the trees and the, and the sun rising as well. This is what I got from internet. It's not mine, but there are people walking. You can see these silhouettes against this, the rising sun. And so we get to the word daybreak. Okay. So verbal now, what does is, what is daybreak really mean? Okay, you they understand the concept of daybreak, but what is daybreak? So there's your pronunciation of the word for the linguistically inclined students, daybreak, how you could say it, what does it mean? They could do this on their phones or they can look it up in dictionaries. It's a time in the morning when daylight first appears. It's dawn. Here's another word for it. What part of speech is it? Those of you who love grammar and language, what part of speech is it? What word class? It's a noun, daybreak. Are there any synonyms for it? Yes, there are millions, and they can go and look at them, look them up, go and find them. It's dawn, break of day, crack of dawn, sunrise, daylight, first light, first thing in the morning, early morning, cockro, all these words that you could use. Right, and there's a lovely picture to show daybreak again. And let's get on to our poem. It's by Henry Wordsworth Longfellow, who was around from 1807 to 1882, one of America's greatest poets, so they say. Um, and to give them an audio of something about the poet, what they can listen to, this is where you can start bringing in YouTubes. So if you have a look at this little, I hope you can hear it now. This is from, um, this is just a five minute um, 
video that you can speak to us. Well, hello. Welcome back him. to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was an American poet and educator whose works include Paul Revere's Ride, the Song of Hiawatha, and Evangeline. In Evangeline, he wrote, Man is un." Okay, so there's one way you could do it. I'm just going to stop it now. Oh, yeah, we've got Neil Diamond, who also sings Longfellow Serenade, and you could also play that to them as well. I'm gonna say a name. Okay, so you get the idea. Right, so you can get the story on video, on audio, you can have music to go with it. Um, and you can use a PowerPoint like this. He was an American poet and he was an educator. Um, it's gonna go on here. Let's see if we can move the thing on. Yes. Um, so he often used folk and mythical stories as his material for his poetry. So it's things that were very dear to his heart. They were people living at his time. Also mythical things that he thought about the future, kinds of things. Sorry, I'm just going to stop that. Well, so welcome okay. back to the story of the Right, so his poetry is known for its lyrical quality and song-like features and distinct musicality. So how not to do it, um, possibly on Zoom, it's a bit confusing, but you can still put the links in as well at the bottom. So if you want to go listen to it and see it. So this is how you could give background with audio plus visual plus digital work into the, the poem itself. So I'm going to try and turn this page now. Okay, so here we've got Daybreak again. We've got the poet's name, we've got a verbal reading and hearing, which is auditory. There is the, the PowerPoint, the, um, the link there as well. And if I click here, there is comes up, there's daybreak, the poem, and then you could actually have the words. So if you, I'm going to just stop. A wind reading. came up there out of go. the sea and said, oh, mists, make room for me. It hailed the ships and cried, sail on. Yeah, mariners, the night is gone. Okay, so and hurried landward far. A wind came up out of the sea. Okay, so you can also get the words like this, and you get different one, different students to read it. A wind came up out of the sea and said, "A mists make room for me." All right, so you could go through the reading. The first reading is just what you should do. The second reading, you can start unpacking it. It held the ships and cried, "Sail on, he mariners." The night is gone. So they've got the pictures, they've got the visual, and they've got the words, and they're hearing it. And hurried landwards far away, crying, Awake, it is the day. And he said into the forest, Shout, hang all your leafy banners out. So it's a whole call to wake up in the morning. He touched the wood bird's folded wing and said, A bird, awake, and sing. So even the birds must sing. And oh, the farms, oh, Chantelier, your clarion blown, the day is near. So the cock must stand up and crow to get the day coming. It's a call to wake up and get going. It whispered to the fields of corn, bow down and hail the coming morn. It shouted through the bell fry tower, awake, O oh bell, proclaim thy hour. It crossed the churchyard with a sigh and said, not yet in quiet lie. So there are lots of activities you could have with the, to use different senses, verbal, nonverbal, visual, and so on. Um, one of the things you could do is paraphrase the poem's content. So they could rewrite the different stanzas, the different little lyrical um, couplets. At daybreak, a wind rises from the sea, receives the message of the morning to blow, and it takes up duty to spread the news. So they could get into groups, and each of them can paraphrase the different little couplets of the poem. Heavy mists obstruct the wind. Um, the first it sees the ships anchored and all that. So they are paraphrasing maybe two couplets each group and they do it all in their own words. And there's your pictures again to support it as well. There's the ships that are called also and there's the anchor of the ship. Those are how you could get the words right. So this is the full poem as well. Um, you can see the couplets here as well. Um, it's a lyrical poem. There are nine rhyming couplets here. 
Um, there's the first one. A wind came out, out of the sea and said, oh, miss, make room for me. So it's the sea and the me. Um, it keeps the flow of the wind in mind, this whole breezy style of the poem. And the reader moves with the wind from one place to another. So it comes from the sea, it goes to the ships and hurries to the land. Um, then it goes to the forest, then it goes to the birds, and then it goes to the farms, and then it goes to the fields of corn, then it goes to the bell tower, and then it goes to the churchyard. So as the wind comes through, it goes to all these places to get everyone to wake up and start their day. So the wind is personified as a poet places his own words on its lips. Um, so the wind is speaking. It said to the forest, shout, hang all your leafy banners out. So it's personifying um, the poet's voice with the wind, and it captures the earth's mood and atmosphere at daybreak, this need to wake up. Urge for work is the poem's central theme. So I wonder about what all our, um, our generation Xs, our generation Ys, um, millennial students are feeling at this whole call to work. I'm a baby boomer, so we all enjoy working, I think. So there's also vocab, for those of you who like vocab, you could find opposites from the poem, um, laugh, cry, near, far, night, day, sleep, awake, truth, lie. So there are lots of things you could do in German from grammar to try and work on the different words and find synonyms or antonyms from them. Also, you could do personification, um, metaphor, simile type of exercises for them. If you want to do this as a kind of introduction to it, um, the sailor, uh, which word the sailor go with, sail on, the trees goes with, rustle your leaves, the dead is keep sleeping, the mists make way for the wind, and the people um, awake, the night is over. So these are various things that you can match what the wind said to the various objects. So there's also group activities you can have. You can divide the class into groups, one activity per group. Um, use internet if you need it, if you've got it. Um, there's no outage. Um, answer questions using PowerPoints for your students so they can present it to the class. Ensure you have visual support for your slides because many students are very visual and helps them to imagine what's happening. And then they must all present their activities to the class. So if you're into groups, it's interpersonal using that. If you use the internet to find stuff, it's linguistic that you're doing. Um, you're also using logic and linguistic with your questions and your PowerPoints. Your visual is a more spatial thing that you're helping them with. Um, and then presenting your activity to the class is interpersonal. So you're using all the different talents that you can have for differentiated teaching in your class. So there's your first activity, um, which you, what you could do here is um, word, oh, I can see this underneath here. Word use, okay. Um, discuss careful word choices the poet made when selecting words and the value, the understanding of the words, various meanings. Then what they must do is provide three word examples for your discussion. So they must go through the poem and decide which three words they're going to use. Then they must select five object words that the wind addressed in the poem. So it's all about word use. And from the words, identify the poem's literal and symbolic figurative meaning. So for those words, were they literal or figurative? So you've got your three words, you've got your five object words, and you've got to say whether they're literal or figurative. And then use pictures to capture the meaning of those words, and this will all be done on PowerPoint. All right, see how pretty that is. Someone can group and get onto the poet's background, discuss any three ways um, an understanding of his life enriches the reader's appreciation of the poem. So if you know something about his background, how can you understand more about the poem? Then they've got to reflect on these biographical details. They can maybe say five biographical details that are reflected in the poem. And how does this help you to understand the imagery and the themes in the poem? And then obviously get visual support for your three selected aspects, three selected aspects of Longfellow's life. Oh, yes. And here's the bell tower. Um, it shouted through the bell for our tower. Awake, O bell, proclaim the hour. Why, what is symbolic about that? Why was that selected? Third activity, um, the poem structure, okay, the lyrical structure of it, rewrite the poem using your own interpretation of the wind, so they could rewrite using their own words, maybe a modern type of um, poem that they could write. Activity four group could look at figurative language, um, how he uses metaphor and personification, um, then they've got to list all the words that are personified or are using metaphor. How does an understanding of the poem depend on the reader noticing both its literal and figurative qualities? So they've got to think about that as well. 
and then design a nice logo for Daybreak, something like that, which would be a quite fun exercise to do. Um, activity five is the form, rhythm, and meter of the poem. What is form, rhythm, and meter? They can go and search that on the internet. Um, practice scansion, that is stressed and unstressed of the first couplet as well. Um, unstressed and stressed words, yes, the poem. A wind came up out of the sea and said, oh, miss, make room for me. It's like a, basically like an iambic pentameter type of rhythm, and they can try and do meter with, their, with themselves and practice it. And then select a contemporary song, and then identify how that uses meter, rhyme, and rhythm. Go and get their favorite song and also show how it shows rhyme and rhythm. Okay, so it could be a modern day twist on that. Um, activity six, um, what makes a great poet? Identify three of Longfellow's poetic qualities and provide an example of each. So what three things made him a great poet? Maybe personification and give an example of that. Discuss how his poetry can teach us about the concerns of his day. What is he concerned about? That people aren't working, <laughs> that they're not doing enough, that they're not rising early. Um, what were his concerns? That also goes back into his background. And relate these qualities to the central theme. So if you think about his day, how did he capture this in the actual poem, Daybreak? There he is. And he says there, a single conversation across the table with a wise man is better than 10 years of study of books. So if you've got a wise person around you, just having a conversation is better than learning all those books. Very wise man, I think. Okay, that's it. I'm finished. I'm over and out. Poetry is the thoughts that breathe and words that burn. So what you want, I want you to take away from this is not just do the traditional way of looking at a poem. There's many different ways we can look at it verbally, non-verbally, visually, I'm using the internet, I'm capturing all the different strengths of our differentiated student population. Okay, we'll chat soon and take care.